Welcome to our second webinar for the SIPS PD1 Leadership in Procurement and Supply. Today we're going to look at Learning Outcome 2, which um, covers being able to create a communication plan to influence personnel involved in a supply chain. The specific unit content for 2.1 are evaluate the main influencing styles that can be used in the effective leadership of a supply chain, um, implementing a vision, models for managing in four directions, and in fact we only look at one model, the relevance of managing upwards and across, which links of course directly to managing in four directions, and the merits of escalation as a means of influencing. Uh, and finally, a range of influencing styles for cross-functional leadership, both within and outside the bounds of formal teams. The um, managing in four directions uh, is based on a paper by Body and Buchanan, and the diagram there shows the four directions that a leader in procurement could be involved with. You could be managing upwards, where you're trying to influence your superiors. You could be managing down your staff who work under you. And you could be managing across different functions in the company, uh, different areas. And you could also be managing the project team. So we've got up, down, and across in two directions there. Some key readings there if you want to read some more. It's a very good article by Bongues. Um, you can click on that link and um, go to that reading. So, a bit more on the Body and Buchanan theory there. We've got managing across, leading and influencing stakeholders outside the team, managing the team, managing the staff. This direction refers to leading and influencing direct parts. And the probably most difficult area is managing up where this refers to leading and influencing your senior management. Uh, and if you remember from our key definitions of leadership, influencing is a key function of leadership. So influencing has been recognized as an essential element and there's a common definition of leadership that has the word influence in there, a process of social influence in which one person is able to enlist the aid and support of others in the accomplishment of a common task. Um, Eukalia, um, who wrote various papers with other writers such as Falb, um, came up with nine influencing tactics. These were briefly outlined on your negotiation module, but they are not really negotiation tactics. These are styles that a manager can use to influence upwards, downwards, or across. Um, they are named in section three, very heavily examined. So you do need to learn these. These are very, very important. Um, and they start off um, from sort of pulling the softly, softly approach, rational persuasion, right through to the um, push big stick approach at the bottom there pressure so there's nine styles there rational persuasion uh, which is logical argument and evidence inspiration appeal appeal to the influences ideals values and aspirations consultation which is what it says ingratiation getting the influencer to think well of you um, or to be in a cooperative frame of mindset um, exchange personal appeal, um, coalition, and legitimating, which is establishing the objective legitimacy of a request by claiming the authority or right to make it, or by verifying that it is consistent with organization, policies, procedures, strategy, etc. And then of course, pressure is what it says. It's threatening sanctions, using assertiveness, and it can be bordering on aggression to demand compliance. So if you've not come across the UCL nine influencing tactics, very, very important that you are familiar with these. Um, when you're looking at managing in four directions, you would select two or three of these styles which are suitable for the direction in which you are 
managing. Um, effectiveness of influence and tactics, well how effective and how successful you are um, can lead to commitment where you've won the hearts and minds. It can lead to compliance where they carry out the action um, but are rather apathetic and unenthusiastic and then the worst effect if it doesn't work at all is resistance where the person opposes the requested action and tries to avoid it by refusing. So three possible results and obviously commitment is what we're looking for although at times compliance will suffice. Managing upwards, a very difficult direction where the issue is lack of authority and it requires assertiveness and subtlety. Um, the use of threat on your superior at work is not going to be an effective tactic. So we need to persuasively communicate to our superiors, use the right channels, um, be concise, relevant, professional, timely, logical arguments, supported conclusions, present a business case, um, and rational persuasion is the tactic from Yuckles 9 is the most used when we're influencing upwards. Managing downwards with a few more options here um, from straightforward appeal because you're a transformational or democratic leader so you're trying to um, not tell them initially. Um, you might try rational persuasion, getting buy-in but at the end you can use pressure and that's the preference by autocratic leaders. So three straightforward tactics or styles there. Managing across, a little more difficult than managing downwards and it can be you're working cross-functional teams, cross-functional networks um, and more specifically cross-functional leadership roles. There could be a team leader, project manager, there's likely to be a team or project sponsor key stakeholder has primary responsibility for the achievement of the team or project's business objectives and who provides and is accountable for the resources invested in the project. Um, the team though could be um, autonomous or self-managing where they're um, running the cells making their own decisions so there are various degrees of how involved you'll be in cross-functional leadership or the different roles. The challenges of cross-functional working, um, as with many matrix structures, there can be problems, it can be time consuming, um, horizontal structures may lack clear authority, teams may take time to develop, uh, which is um, based on the Tuckman theory of team formation. There may be difficulties of dual authority and conflict in demands, effectively you might have two bosses and there may be practical difficulties of organising meetings and information flows, getting everybody together and getting them to allocate the time required. Um, the individual and team contribution, the contribution must be commissioned by clear objectives, controlled by clear values and policies and championed by leadership support and cooperative yeah, we see many of these models 4C, so this is yet another um, 4C model. Um, and here we've got a 3C model. What people are able to do depends upon their capacity, their competence and their creativity. So um, the capability of your team members is a big influence on your leadership style. And obviously the composition of your team, um, team players will have different behaviours, different characteristics and the most well known theory that sums this up is the Belbin team theory where Belbin proposed that there are nine roles in any effective team from plant right through to finisher and Belbin of course didn't say there had to be nine in a team, Belbin suggested that effective teams had somebody who at least fulfilled each of these functions but one person might fulfill more than one um, function. Belbin also went on to say well leaders can be broadly summarised into two styles when you're managing teams. 
can be pretty much um, solo leader or they can be the team leader um, and the solo leader is more the autocratic leader enjoys free range the leader takes no risk adapts a directive approach as opposed to team leader approach um, which builds on diversity seeks talents develops colleagues and creates missions so there are two sort of opposites styles of leadership you could say they are styles of influencing one is solo leader one is team leader and that's from the work of Belbin in 1993 there are also challenges in modern workplace of managing virtual teams where people are dispersed around the globe that can give problems of how to build team building and coordination communication how to supervise and lead a um, virtual team there can be problems with cultural diversity um, infrastructure and logistical issues affect virtual teams um, positive team relationships key values what how do we how do we get positive relationships consideration trust equitable treatment credit where it's due equal opportunities diversity ethical conduct these are all key values that the leader should um, support um, and walk the walk as well as talk the talk how do we contribute to motivating our team well we need to give them clear goals objectives we need to involve them encourage participation and we need to give them feedback very important and praise and recognition so a nice um, easy summary there of how we might contribute to motivation there are 10 building blocks for effective teams and perhaps the woodcock team building blocks is slightly the better theory than this rather general what we need for effective teams leadership membership climate or culture objectives achievement work methods communication etc etc so the 10 building blocks for effective teams um, are important uh, and it's important that a leader um, is aware of what's required to build an effective team. The leader can be obviously very effective by being transformational, by being inspirational and we looked earlier in section one at what transformational leadership is um, and if a leader is transformational they'll be influencing their team by idealised influence winning respect inspirational motivation generate awareness of the value of purpose and team contribution they'll be contributing intellectual stimulation and also considering the individual the leader treats team members as individuals finally on this section where we're going to look at escalation as a means of influence and it's rather a negative um, aspect of influencing but it is one way of getting results um, and you could say the influencing tactics can be seen as progressive escalation where you start at the top from pull and you actually escalate the tactics right through to the bottom if you have to to eventually you're going to push and force through the um, required action escalation gives a clear message that you're serious but there are costs, resentment, resistance uh, and it could involve appealing to a higher authority um, to escalate it further. Um, the merits are of influencing, they give clear message, there are costs and may involve appeal. Uh, procurement could be involved in influencing and involved um, in some marketing planning where they need to consider who are their key customers what are their needs, wants and expectations, the need to consider the customer's perceptions of the status and credibility of procurement and who are the key competitors of procurement in providing services to internal customers. So procurement um, can be involved in marketing planning and there are some key questions there that um, can be asked to um, ascertain the effectiveness of procurement. Leading 
to develop performance, the three C's. So if you've got poor performance, what, what can be causing it? It can be, of course, a lack of commitment, that they aren't motivated, they aren't driven. It could be contribution, the conditions required for effective performance, um, cap capability, the actual ability of your staff or team can lead to um, poor performance. So you need to be aware of the three C's of performance. Um, commitment there, a bit more detailed on it, and that links from the Porter, Mowbray and Steers theories. And commitment is the relative strength, the individual's identification with and involvement in a particular organization. So it's not quite the same as motivation. Organization commitment um, is really how much you believe uh, and would sort of recommend the organization that you work into other people. So big idea is commitment. Right, that completes section 2.1. 2.2 then moves on to leadership techniques to influence personnel. So we've still got this word influence there, but we've got some particular leadership techniques. Uh, and we're going to refer back to the Hertzsche and Blanchard, which we looked at in webinar one. And we're going to look at KPIs, measures of effectiveness, and a wide range of leadership development issues. So assessing the readiness of followers or groups. Um, how ready are the followers or groups for a particular task? Um, from your studies in section one, we looked at the Hershey and Blanchard situational leadership model, which proposes four styles of management from telling, selling, participating, delegating, so TSPD, not to be confused with the um, Ashridge School of Management styles. The style of management, according to Hershey and Blanchard, depends on the readiness of the followers and the followers can be unable or worse still unwilling in which case to be classed as R1s and you would adapt an S1 style which is telling they could be unable to do it but willing or confident to try R2s so that could involve selling um, R3 is able but unwilling which might mean um, you have to adapt a um, S3 style participating and R4 is where they're both able and willing or confident uh, in which case you can use the delegating style so a very simple theory that matches up the leadership style to the readiness of the followers and we've got the um, four grid box there which talks about relationship behaviour low to high and task behaviour from low to high. Um, so high relationship behaviour um, is uh, participating and selling, low, low relationship behaviour is delegating and telling, um, and one is somehow more task orientated than the others. Now which style you should adopt it does depend on the readiness of the followers, and it also depends on them um, driving forces within yourself, um, the situation and the readiness of the followers. And now leadership's attitude to people has been documented extensively and one very important and quite simple theory is McGregor's theory X and Y, which are two extremes um, of behaviour or attitude. If you're a theory X manager you assume the average person is lazy, doesn't like work, so you have to stand over them, you have to supervise them, you have to, um, they don't want responsibility. But if you've got a theory why mindset where you think people come to work because it's natural, people will exercise self-control, they'll be committed and they want to accept responsibility, they want to be fulfilled, so that's the two, that will influence your leadership style that you adapt, whether you're a theory X or theory Y person. You might adapt management by objectives as part of a um, method of um, performance reviews and um, motivating T 
team members uh, and the management by objectives is where a strategic plan is developed with clear goals and then these are cascaded down to departments and individuals and hopefully the objectives that you are set link into the department's objectives which again link into the strategic plan an MBO management by objectives is a theory or method um, widely um, promoted by Drucker a very famous management writer internal performance management can be about preparing performance agreements preparing development plans management of performance throughout the year and the performance review and appraisal which I'm sure most of you will be familiar with so performance management is a very broad area and there are four big areas there highlighted on the slide as part of performance management we need smart KPIs which will be specific measurable attainable or some people would say achievable relevant and time bounded which is a concept you've come across several times before in your studies smart objectives or smart KPIs in this Matt, how do we develop KPIs the standard SIP slide here identify the CSFs and identify measures for each CSF and then develop KPIs and there might be just one KPI for a CFS or there could be two three but not too many the benefits of KPIs well the benefits of measuring anything they provide objective uh, rather than subjective measures reduces conflict can increase performance motivation um, and focus key result areas for the team so it can be part of continuous improvement not necessarily just monitoring and control the formal appraisal system can be peer appraisal upward appraisal by the leader's subordinates internal customer appraisal and it could even involve appraisal by suppliers so these are some examples of formal appraisal systems how do we measure leadership effectiveness very difficult um, but broadly speaking the performance of the team the motivation and commitment of the team um, the development and improvement of individual teams capabilities internal and external stakeholders awareness of the um, vision goals of the supply chain how effective change is handled trust communication um, and how responsive procurement are to changing needs very very broad areas there Kaplan and Norton um, you've come across in your studies before developed the balanced scorecard which is a way of measuring organizational results not necessarily the leader in procurement but if the company is being led properly um, the results will show in the balanced scorecard and we could develop a balanced scorecard for procurement which inherently then would reflect how effective the leader in procurement and supply is and there are four perspectives in the balanced scorecard financial so not just about profits so sorry profits turnover and key financial measures but the balance scorecard also looks at soft measures um, how customers see us and viewers um, it looks at innovation and learning and it looks at internal businesses what must we excel at um, and there should be a few KPIs in each of these perspectives and Kaplan and Norton propose probably no more than 20 25 at the most measures which will be unique to each organization um, so it's an important um, tool is balanced scorecard and it is balanced because it looks at more than finance and some measures are said to be leading and some are lagging particular financial results are just reporting on what we did last year not necessarily what's going to happen in the future uh, management development um, we've got Kolb's experiential learning cycle here uh, which is one way of developing and learning for leaders and team members um, and it's learning by doing we experience uh, 
by doing something we reflect on that we conceptualize and then we develop learning and theories from that and then we try out uh, new learning and repeat the cycle so you should be familiar with Kolb's experiential learning cycle it should be something you've covered at management at level five um, and it is an important part of leadership development it is um, learning by doing learning by um, case studies or learning by simulations perhaps leadership skills then um, can be differentiated from other characteristics of leadership because they are behavioral they are controllable and they are developable developable um, leaders can be developed like negotiation skills so leaders are not born um, but can be developed um, what skills do leaders need um, influencing negotiation inspiration support challenge integrity and ethics uh, leaders need to have integrity and ethics uh, by being honest by being authentic being by credible um, and leaders perhaps need emotional intelligence which is more than IQ it is the soft skills of being aware of your own feelings and thoughts and being aware of other people's um, motivations and feelings the um, domains of self emotional intelligence which was first was Goldman's largely associated with can be about self-awareness regulation motivation empathy and social skills not named on your unit content but could be brought into an essay answer on um, to explain the behavior of people who work in your department and it can be important that the leader has these um, emotional intelligence behaviors or skills dare we call them so Goldman came up with various leadership styles um, from visionary right through to commanding it's not necessary to learn these I think we've covered enough theories already but it's in your study guide uh, but I don't think it offers any practical use for the exams that you're going to sit we've included it there um, if you so wish to learn that but not recommend um, a bit more there on the emotional intelligence and it talks about the actual competencies related to the dimension there EQ in procurement what do we need um, a slightly bigger list here self-awareness resilience motivation sensitivity interpersonal influence intuitiveness conscientious and integrity so rather broader list there of important EQ that's required operating procurement management development um, very important can improve performance um, leaders are unique in the place to optimize customer and shareholder value management development supports management succession so developing managers very very important tools for PDP sorry tools of personal development can be PDPs journals self-development feedback experiential learning and knowledge sharing this is taken straight from your level 5 management unit so you should be familiar with tools of personal development uh, personal development planning um, which is something you should all be doing every year and it results in an action plan um, and you can see the action plan as perhaps a learning contract uh, how do we identify learning and development needs critical incidents discussions developmental discussions and self-assessment and personal development plans and perhaps using um, the SIPS global standard which um, can identify the skills that you're going to need as you progress through your procurement career and it's a very important competency framework which should be very useful to refer to in your exams The final section then in learning outcome two is 
which is the create a communication plan to influence personnel in the supply chain and essentially it's all about stakeholders um, the communication plan should uh, provide an analysis of stakeholders it should indicate how stakeholder mapping influences the communication plan it details leadership influencing styles to obtain stakeholder buy-in we need to indicate how electronic systems can be used to support stakeholder communication we need to understand primary secondary and key stakeholders uh, we need to understand how to obtain buy-in to supply chain strategies perspectives on stakeholder mapping which has been examined a couple of times which basically means there is more than Mendeleev's matrix to consider when we're looking at stakeholder mapping and finally how to use the internet and internet for publishing information which can be very useful for communicating with stakeholders and is an important part of any communication plan so moving on definitions of stakeholders um, they need to take into account the stakeholder organization relationship there's one there from the APM and there's another there from PM Bock, which is the uh, Project Management Institute's um, definition and finally I think the most important one very similar to the um, APM definition is the one from Freeman which is any group or individual who can affect or be affected by the achievement of an organization's objectives so refresh your definition learn one of these very important so we can define a stakeholder we need to classify them and there are several methods to classify stakeholders one is internal connected <coughs> and external and connected would be suppliers would be the banks who lend the company money it would be shareholders and external are more um, government local community and perhaps pressure groups so be very clear on your classification that's one method internal connected external um, and the other method or one of the other, many other methods is primary secondary and key stakeholders and key stakeholders generally would be identified by doing stakeholder mapping so by stakeholder mapping we can identify who the key stakeholders are but they are part of a classification stakeholders in procurement um, you might have to list some typical stakeholders um, and if we think of a particular project we're doing it can be the owner sponsor customers users staff suppliers collaborators um, and perhaps secondary stakeholders not commercially connected but impacted by the project so it'll be fairly wide-ranging when you're listing and detailing possible stakeholders we need to um, identify the stakeholders perhaps by brainstorming or consultation we need to prioritize them by mapping and classifying them um, and we need to understand them their awareness their positions their interests their responses perhaps by directly talking to them so we don't necessarily do this at a distance the project management institute gives us a nice four step process for stakeholder management which is identify them assess their interest and influence develop communication management plans and engage with them and influence them and that's from the PMI and there's some extra reading there if you'd like to um, have a look at that the Mendelow matrix then which you're all very very familiar with is one perspective on stakeholder mapping remember your unit content said perspectives in plural so you need to understand more than one method now Mendelow came up with a power interest matrix which talks about levels of power and levels of interest to determine who are the key players who we need to keep informed where there's probably minimum effort required 
and where stakeholders need to be kept satisfied. So you will have to explain if you use this what are sources of power, not just say powers on one axis, interests on the other. You would need to explain why somebody had power or didn't have power. Similarly on interest you would have to say why they had high interest or low interest. So you should be very very familiar with the Mendelo power interest matrix and remember power times interest equals influence. So the result of high power and high interest is influence. Interest which is the impact that decisions will have on them. Right some new ones for this unit which you won't have seen before there is a power dynam dynamism matrix which was proposed by Garner in 1986 and the axes are very very similar to Mendelo but instead of interest on the bottom axis we've got dynamism which is the extent to which their stance is open to change. So this is recognising that stakeholders have opinions um, they could change their opinions and that this influence or stance um, could be a threat it could cause problems or it might not but we need to assess that um, the other matrix doesn't take um, a, a view of whether their power or interest is positive or negative and that's one of the very big weaknesses of the Mendelo matrix it's very simplistic so this one has um, again similar grid where people can be high power high dynamism which means there can be a big threat or very unpredictable and we can see there low power low dynamism a is few problems so it's quite a nice uh, concept is the um, power dynamism matrix and it's quite easy to um, learn a few words for your possible exams the other one which is widely cited in all the studies is the salience model uh, which shows three intersecting circles um, which show that um, stakeholders can have power, they can have legitimacy and there can be some urgency but the definitive stakeholders are the ones where all three circles overlap and salience is the degree to which the managers give priority to the competing stakeholder claims. So the people with the biggest stakeholder claim um, on this model would be the um, definitive stakeholders here but you can see there are one two three four five six seven different areas on the um, model not an easy one to learn and it's not one I suggest that anybody would learn but it is a different viewpoint on stakeholders um, and as to how to assess who who should have priority who's got the most um, salience I would do the Crowdjet matrix I would add that it is very important to consider um, a stakeholder's stance on a project whether it's positive or negative and certainly the Mendelo matrix doesn't do that so in practice when you're doing stakeholder registers stakeholder mapping you need to assess whether they're likely to be for the project or against the project as a minimum and whether um, how influential they can be in that process so very very important you understand a couple of these models. The crowdjet matrix is an important factor um, because some items will be strategic, some items may be just routine so the, the project um, and the actual environment um, can impact on um, power influence. Um, other analysis we might do, force field, SWOT, network diagrams, stakeholder marketing, relationship management. So there are many sort of generic issues to consider as part of communicating with stakeholders. We do need to do some analysis. So how do we influence customers? Fairly straightforward. Advertising, promotions, personal selling, etc. So influencing customers, um, fairly straightforward. Um, gaining ownership of plans and decisions we need to be careful on um, employer and supply selection and appraisal criteria 
we need human resource and supply development activities, government structures, reward and incentive arrangements, and we need to ensure that strategies are adequately reached. Stakeholder communication, very, very important. We need to establish a formal plan so that the correct audience is identified, it, the right stakeholders are reached. Information is spread to the right people, it's efficiently spread, messages are coherent, confidential information is spread on a need to know basis, etc. etc. So, a very important slide. We don't just do a Mendlo matrix and finish, we need to understand the bigger picture on developing the communication plan. So why do communication programs fail? Many reasons. Planning, poor planning, lack of resources, uh, communication, wrong techniques, lack of support and resistance. Uh, so many reasons why communication programs can fail. Uh, we need to manage issues, particularly on projects, through issue identification, prioritising, analysis, response action programming and evaluation. Quite a big list there. What ICT tools can we use to communicate? Pretty straightforward. Big range here, right through from web conferencing to um, corporate websites. So fairly straightforward ICT tools for stakeholder communication. Corporate websites can be used effectively and it is a good range of um, offering general communication to stakeholders, wide global reach um, and support gathering analysis of stakeholder data. Benefits of intranets as opposed to extranets, um, they can support communication, link remote sites, allow authorised access so intranets can be used as part of communication, as can extranets which obviously may give your supplier access to certain information, so it can be very useful. Communication methods, this isn't definitive, but there's a list here of general methods, presentations, training sessions, discussions, emails, newsletters, websites, tutorials, um, and perhaps more formal newsletters and reports and several others could be added to that list. So the unit content talks about developing a stakeholder communication plan. You have to be very careful on this, it's, it's more than just the um, simple who we're going to communicate with, how and how often, it's, it's the broader concept. So a stakeholder plan might have an introduction, or should have, it should have some form of stakeholder analysis out of which comes an engagement strategy and an influencing approach and then the communication plan will come out of that and then we will evaluate um, how well the communications is working or did work and there's a very good article there at the PMI on how to manage projects so a six um, heading plan there. There is no set structure. Um, I've got one here from um, which I'll show you the source in a minute which is a template which uh, you insert the project name, you do the introduction to provide a plan with when, what, how and whom the information flows will be established and give an overview of why stakeholder activities take in place. We need to know what the objectives of the um, communication plan are. We need to know what the key messages we're trying to communicate are. Then we need to do the stakeholder mapping, identify the high power um, interested people, high power less interested and um, devise broad engagement strategies. Um, so we need to decide the engagement tactics and the channels, whether it's speeches, websites, working groups, seminars, etc. We need to set up a project calendar to set out the timing of the activity to ensure all the team know the key milestones and when the activities need to take place. There may be perhaps um, a budget section. Uh, very important that we have an evaluation. 
metrics, uh, how we're going to measure, what we're going to measure, and how can we get feedback from the stakeholders, what's worked well, what have we learned, and that's taken from um, a civil service um, website page there which gives some good guidance on uh, a standard stakeholder plan template. Now perhaps most of you will be more familiar with the more limited communication plan with um, more like this the communication method team briefing format restricted infranet how often daily who's going to get the team briefing the team and stakeholders right through to weekly web bulletin there um, frequency so that's a fairly common format is what is the communication method how frequent was it and how we're going to distribute it a comprehensive one here is who's the audience what are the messages we're trying to convey to them how we're going to do it which media written reports there how frequently weekly daily hourly monthly timing responsibility who's responsible for the communication and what is the feedback mechanism I rather like that example it gives you some very good headings for the communication plan but remember the communication plan isn't just this template it is the full set of identifying stakeholders and stakeholder analysis and then developing the communication plan and then evaluating um, the success and outcomes of the communication plan um, a blank template there um, again quite useful one who's the stakeholder what's their power and interest what's the key interest and issues how we're going to communicate how frequently and general comments so there isn't a set um, de facto communication plan or template there are many you might have your own one at work but how to develop a communication plan um, is finally, finally then here's our summary of what we've covered in um, the second webinar we've looked at learning outcome two which is be able to create a communication plan to influence personnel involved in a supply chain there were three learning outcomes for this um, section evaluate the main influencing styles um, and we've looked at models for managing in four directions which was the Buchanan and body managing up managing down and managing across we've looked at a range of influencing styles and a very important theory there from Yukul who has devised nine influencing tactics ranging from uh, pull to push so you need to learn those nine tactics we then looked at some leadership techniques and particularly the um, situational leadership theory of Hersey and Blanchard which discusses R1, R2 for areas of readiness and leadership styles to adapt. We looked briefly at leaders attitudes which can be summarised by McGregor's theory X and theory Y. Um, we looked at a range of KPIs etc and then in 2.3 we've looked at the communication plan to influence personnel in the supply chain which cover the stakeholders classifications and the very important new content which was perspectives on stakeholder mapping which is the standard power interest matrix from Mendelo but also introduced us to the power dynamism matrix and the three circles in the salience analysis of stakeholders so a broad overview there and of course we'll cover this in more detail um, more specific revision during January thanks for that and I'll speak to you um, next week